Okay. So now I'm going to turn it over to the Bell Museum's planetarium team, Sarah Copperud, who uh, you've already met some, several times today, and Thaddeus LaCourcier. Um, for, they're going to take us for the final time this week to share and discuss images taken from telescopes on the Bell's observation deck earlier this week, earlier this month. Uh, it's a real bummer that the clouds haven't cooperated uh, this this week. Um, and so, uh, so, but we have great plans despite the fact that we can't, we can't be on the roof deck, roof deck. So I will let them take it away. Know that if you have any questions, Sarah and Tad would love to hear them. So use the Q&A box to put your questions there and we will do our best to get to those over the next hour. Okay, planetarium team, it is all you. Okay, so tonight I'm really excited because this is one of my favorite topics. Yes, it's a little cloudy outside, and yes, it's been mostly cloudy all week, but we've had a few nights with live telescope observing. Um, we got a little bit last night from University of Minnesota Duluth Planetarium, um, but that doesn't mean we're not going to have fun, because Tad and I have some cool stuff available for you tonight. It's all about the life cycle of stars, my favorite topic, one of but before we get into that, we do want to encourage you. We're getting to the end of the week. And um, if you've tuned in earlier this week, we are doing a Globe at Night Challenge. So on Monday night, we learned about the importance of our night skies and the dark skies that we have. Um, but it's also important to measure them because it's different in every location. And so this week, up through the 16th, when uh, the new moon is tonight, we are looking at the constellation of Pegasus. So here's our star map tonight, and Pegasus is right south center here. And so if you have a moment, take a look at the Globe at Night instructions on our website. And look out at Pegasus. Probably not tonight since it's cloudy, but maybe tomorrow or the next night. And make your observations of how much of it you can see and what does it look like in your sky. So go do that. We're, we're trying to get to 500 observations this week, all for the Minnesota Statewide Star Party. So make sure to note MM. MN Star Party in your observations. So you do that citizen science project to help us with the challenge. Oh, here's a, the Globe at Night web app. So it's all online. Um, it's a web, web app version. Okay, but life cycles of stars. And Tad, feel free to jump in at any point here too. Um, what do you mean life cycles of stars? Stars are just stars, aren't they? I mean, they're always going to be there. Well, it turns out there's a process here. They go through stellar formation, and then not all stars are the same when they come out, when they are formed. And then that means they all have different amounts of fuel, they're all different temperatures, and that way they're all gonna die in different ways. Because yes, stars do die. And we can all observe this. There's some great examples of this whole entire stellar life cycle in our sky this fall and coming into winter. So what we're gonna do, brief overview, if we look here in the middle of our screen, stars start in a nebula. So we're gonna look at one of my favorite nebulas out in the sky here coming up in late fall, going into winter. Some stars aren't that big when they're made. And so they're gonna be low mass stars that are a little bit more like our sun. Our sun is a low to medium mass star. So this is kind of the path our sun will take through its life cycle. But then as they near the end of their life cycles, they're turned into red giants. And then they'll eventually turn into planetary nebulas, which at the core will have a white dwarf at the at left over. But that's just some of the stars out there. Some stars, when they're forming in this nebula here, they get massive, they get huge. And so they're high mass stars, which they'll turn into a red supergiant, and they can explode in a supernova explosion, which can leave behind either a neutron star or even a black hole. So this is what we're gonna talk about tonight and see what are stars doing up, up there in our sky and what can we see of each of these different phases of their life cycles here. So we're gonna start actually looking to the east. Now this is our star map from just after sunset. So it's not quite up right after sunset, but it's coming up right over here, just off to the east, just to the east of Taurus the bull. So Taurus has these horns here. You can imagine those being the horns of Taurus the bull. That star right there, Aldebaran, is a red supergiant. That's the eye of the bull. And Orion will be just about the edge of our star map here. If you wait a little bit later in the night, it should be up about right now, actually. Um, you'll see Orion coming up above the horizon. And in Orion is the Orion Nebula. 
And I've been watching all week. You've probably heard me say it's my one of my favorite things, if not my favorite thing to look at in the sky. And that's the picture I have behind me here. This is the Hubble Space Telescope picture where we see all these colors. But you can see here in this picture taken from our roof deck upstairs on the Bell Museum, we can see that center part of the nebula and those cluster of stars right there. And those are the same ones behind me here, kind of right in the middle there, that bright spot. And we're starting to get, using one of our colored cameras upstairs, we're starting to get some of those blues and those reds, those gases glowing from the star forming nebula. Because stars, they're born in these, you can think of these star forming nebulas as stellar nurseries. There's all this gas and dust flying around, just kind of floating in space. And every now and then it gets a little nudge. And that gas starts to fall together, it starts to compress and collect. And when you get enough gas and dust together, it gets hotter and hotter and tighter and it gets bigger and bigger. This collection of material gets bigger and eventually it'll turn on and nuclear fusion will start and then you have the birth of a brand new star. Now Ted has something fun for us, kind of to show how gas and dust can get blown around in outer space and it can collect to form a star. Ted, do you think you could show us a little bit about this? Because this could be fun. I can. And uh, before I do, I actually want to mention that actually the, so some of the things we're doing tonight, you can do yourself. Um, in fact, this very first one is part of an activity from NiceNet, N-I-S-E-N-E-T. Um, and it uses materials that you, many of which I think you'll probably have right around you uh, at your home, uh, especially if you have long hair. So I'm going to switch my camera over and uh, we'll get this. Okay, well, I definitely have long hair right now. I haven't been to the hairstylist since before COVID hit, so we'll see how long my hair gets. I definitely have hair ties, if that's what he's referring to. But it looks like a little fun setup you got over there, Tad. As he comes wheeling into view. And so it looks like he's holding a hair dryer. And then he has... Um, oh, he's fluffing up his own hair. Okay. <laughs> hey, Sarah. Is it is Molly, I'm going to interrupt you for a minute because I think we're on speaker view. We can't see Tad. We can only see you. Okay, guys. I will stop so, sharing my screen there so we can see what Tad's up to. Perfect. Thank you. And Tad might need to talk just to get him on the screen. Okay. All right. So can I, uh, maybe, hopefully, are you seeing me now, Holly? Well, are you seeing the demo, Holly? Yep, oh, yeah. I, you, yep, I saw you, Tad, so keep talking. All right, all right. Well, uh, I will need to turn off my uh, audio for this, so hopefully we stay in view. But Holly, if you can just jump in and let us know if, if I disappear. Okay, so I have you in gallery view, so I can still see you, Tad. There he is, wheeling back. <laughs> um, so he has the hair dryer. Wonderful. Okay, it also looks like he has a basket full of styrofoam balls, it looks like. It's attached to kind of a, a spice rack, if you will. Okay, and then a clear container in the middle. That looks like what's gonna collect our star here. Uh, and all those styrofoam balls represent the gas and dust that are in outer space, in this nebula. Um, and that's gonna be our star once we collect enough material, it looks like. Okay, so in outer space, in these star forming nebulas, there's lots of gas and dust floating around. But I said something needs to kind of come and nudge that gas. And what nudges gas and dust in outer space are stellar winds, winds from other stars. Sometimes it could be explosion. Sometimes um, it could just be a big gust of wind from a star. Our sun puts off solar wind as well. Okay, and so he's going to blow dry his hair here. And let's see what he does with the hair dryer representing that uh, solar wind. Oh, so we're able to then get these particles of gas and dust bouncing around, blowing through outer space, which is our basket here. And we're gonna see how much stuff, how much of that gas and dust, those styrofoam balls, Tad can collect in about 30 seconds. Oh, he turned it on high. There must've been a supernova explosion by, nearby. So now we got the gas and dust flowing around really quickly. And like I said, different stars uh, are when they form, some of them are small, some of them are large. Um, and it all just depends on how much of this material is forming. And so if Tad collected a bunch of stuff, it looks like time is out. Let's see how much material was collected to form our star. Looks like a good number of gas and dust uh, styrofoam particles there for us. And he's gonna measure it out in our tube here.
This is the tube of science for everyone. Tube of science. Okay, how much did we get? What are the results, Dad? All right, well, we lost some gas and dust there, but that's okay. Lost a little bit of dust. All right, so I switched that up there. And there sorry, I, maybe you said this. I couldn't hear you. Um, there's a hair dryer going. Uh, it was set on low initially, so that was very, you know, just a little bit of uh, interstellar radiation, a little bit of gas and dust moving around. You could see that wasn't really doing a lot. There wasn't really anything being collected. There was some motion, but it was just sort of there. When I switched to high, though, I'm betting if you're watching, you saw that you saw that gas and dust, the styrofoam balls, they were jumping around, uh, and they filled up the container. So it looks like in this case, uh, when I ran it, uh, it actually it got up to our blue line here, which we're measure measuring as a high mass star, uh, and blue blue for a very good reason. Um, we also have some markers there if they've gone for a low mass star, um, a little red star, and way down the bottom might have actually happened if I, if I kept on going with the low is uh, with our gas giant planet. So not even a star, but a planet forming out of gas there, out of very little motion of gas. Okay, so that kind of demonstrates here, I'm gonna switch back to our picture of Orion that uh, was taken on our roof deck here. Um, so that kind of shows us how this gas and dust in the Orion Nebula here um, can collect and form these stars uh, in the nebula. And all the different materials, there's some oxygen, there's a hydrogen, there's lots of different gases here, and that's what is making this color that we've been able to pick up in our image. But what happens once stars are formed? Because one nebula is huge, it's ginormous. It's not gonna form just one star. It's actually gonna form a bunch of stars. And so while the Orion Nebula is in Orion's sword, just hanging off his belt, which is one of the more famous constellations or more recognizable constellations in our sky, um, we're gonna take a look at what happens when many stars are formed inside these nebulas at the same time. And for this, we are actually going to be looking, oops, in the constellation of Cassiopeia. And so Cassiopeia is one of those constellations we can see all year long. So she's towards the middle of our star map here, uh, towards kind of the zenith, straight above our head. So it's this W of stars. And if you'd follow these N2 stars here, kind of in the northeast, and draw a straight line, not quite to the, where the middle star is, but right here, just off the edge of these two stars, we can see a cluster of stars uh, known as Caldwell 13. Um, we're shortening to C13, which is an open cluster in Cassiopeia. So, Tad, do you have anything you want to share about this constel or this grouping of stars with us? He might be resetting our 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 demo there. He might be trying to see if he can find form different different size stars. <laughs> there you are. All right. Um Oh, are you seeing me? I can't see myself. I can see you. Okay, good. Then I assume everyone else can see me as well. Um, I will, uh, well, you know, maybe I'll speak very briefly just uh, sort of how I got some of these images. Um, Go for it. Because these are, in a way, I'm not an astro, I'm not a professional astro astrophotographer by any stretch of the imagination. Um, so these were really simple images. I, I took a Canon T6, so a pretty common DSLR digital camera. Um, I did attach it to a telescope, so it is in the back of a telescope. It's an eight-inch telescope. Um, and then I just took, in this case, these were some, um, oh, if I remember correctly, these are about five or ten-second exposures, so not a very long time. Um, and I, this was also a very cold morning, if I remember correctly. Um, so these are pretty simple images, and, and actually they, they are very similar to what you would see if you went and looked through a telescope yourself. So in many cases, cameras do help us oh, so much with seeing so much more detail. But with the nice thing though with simple images is it does mimic what we all get to see just with our own eyes. Um, so if you, if you do have a telescope or you know, large pair of binoculars, you can actually get a view just like this yourself. And so these open clusters are um, all, all stars that are formed from the same star forming nebula. Now, I keep specifying star-forming nebulas because there's some other nebulas we'll talk about a little bit later that their names can get kind of confusing if we don't say their full name. Um, but they're, they can have a couple of hundred, a couple thousand stars that form in these open clusters. And we call them open clusters because these stars are kind of fairly spread out and there's no um, organization that they have to have. So uh, the other type of cluster that we've talked a lot about this week, you've seen Mark Job um, went through it with us earlier in the week, or globular clusters that were a bunch of stars kind of 
packed together in kind of a circle or a sphere shaped. And those have to be in kind of that tight packed uh, space or that, you know, 3D volume um, to be called a globular cluster. In these case, open clusters don't. They're just stars that are all born roughly at the same, uh, same time. So we know they're roughly the same age, but they're not all the same size or temperature. So they'll all live for different amounts of time. Now, this is just one of the open clusters in our sky that we can see tonight. Um, that, or that you could if the clouds went away. Uh, but let's take a look at another open cluster because they are all slightly different. Okay, this other one um, is just off to the top of Queen Cassiopeia. So we go back to our star map here. We see Cassiopeia, this W of stars. And then this next cluster is just off the top of uh, Cassiopeia, kind of towards our zenith here. And that's Carolyn's Rose Cluster. We saw this a little bit earlier this week as well, but one of uh, the discoveries of Carolyn Herschel, one of those female scientists that uh, you don't hear too much about in the history of science, but that their work contributed greatly to our understanding of our place in the solar system and our solar system in part of the Milky Way, which is part of the universe, that often other people get credit for. But Carolyn Herschel, she was one of um, kind of the powerhouses, if you will, the female powerhouses, and I believe it was her brush brother, William Herschel, that gets most of the credit, um, but she was working with him here, and so this is her her rose cluster here. So you can see it's a little bit different than the open cluster we just saw, um, but this starts a little bit more uh, dispersed. Um, Tad, do you have any favorite elements of this picture we're looking at? I do. In fact, I'd say that maybe maybe my favorite element of this isn't Strictly speaking, the astronomicalness of it, but uh, but it gets the name the Rose Cluster because you can actually in this collection of stars you can pick out these rose petal formations. So the stars do look like what you'd see in a beautiful garden on a beautiful summer day, um, even here in Minnesota, uh, if you can remember those warm summer days. Uh, so this was something I always have a hard time. Uh, I feel like Jerry was talking about this earlier with sketching. Um, I, I have a hard time sometimes imagining what actually seeing what some things are described as. Um, but looking at this image um, as, I was, as I was getting it, uh, these rose petals just really did jump out at me. Um, I do think that in this case, this was really though a case of being able to see it through a camera, being able to stack images to bring out more detail. Um, looking at it at the same time uh, with, with my own eyes, looking through an eyepiece, I didn't see quite that same, that same detail. That being said, I was also looking from inside the Twin Cities where we have a lot of light pollution. Um, and then that does make it really hard to see things. So it's on my list to look at again when I can get back out under really dark skies so I can compare, again, what sort of features can I just see with my own eyes? Um, and now that I have a really great image of it, um, great for what I can do for astrophotography, um, I really have now a great reference point as well. Um, and next, of course, I need to take up sketching too. Well, I'm going to try sketching here in Zoom to see if it shows up because I can kind of see those rose petals, if you will. So I'm going to kind of trace the outline of some of these stars. And this is how I see it. Now, every, everybody's imagination is a little bit different. And so you might see the rose petals in a slightly different way here. But this is kind of the rose petals that I'm seeing as I kind of play connect the dots, the stars. And I feel like I see one sort of upper left. Um, yeah, sort of right there. I feel like that's a nice little, again, petal there. Um, there's also, we get some really nice color with this cluster as well. Um, there's some nice red giants, it's about a billion and a half years old, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's getting up there in age. Uh, so there's some nice red giants and, and that, that gives us some nice color to see too as we look at it. Okay. So we have a few examples of how many stars can be formed inside of one nebula roughly at the same time. But there's a star that we're, a little bit all, we're all a little bit more familiar with. So let's take a look at that. It is our sun. And so we can do solar observing from our roof deck as well. We have filters that go on our telescopes that make it safe to view the sun. Now, the sun's been pretty quiet lately. Astro Bob yesterday talked a little bit about it and how the sun goes through these cycles where it'll go through a very active period where there'll be lots of sunspots. And then it'll kind of go through a quieter period where it's, there's not much going on. And we're just coming out of one of those quieter periods of time. But by looking through, um, it looks like we have a few different views of our, tel of our sun here. Um, over on the left, if you look down at the bottom, we see these little, I'm going to call them like hairs sticking out around the edge. And if we follow all the way up to the top, maybe around the one o'clock part of um, kind of a clock, we see kind of a big one up here. 
And so those are uh, prominences, kind of material from the sun that are almost erupting off the surface of the sun here. And sometimes they can be accompanied by solar flares. If we take a look over here, we have a slightly different view of the sun from the same day. We can see a little bit uh, clearer those prominences coming up from the bottom of the sun here. And we see that prominence up kind of at that, that one o'clock view as well. It's almost like something's are, are pulling off the, the sun, kind of like hairs, kind of like a troll hair, it almost looks like to me. Um, but this is what happens a bit more when the sun is active, when we see more sunspots. And there's actually a sunspot recently, not too long ago, which has been one of the few that we've had. It's been a pretty quiet time for the sun. And so here's a different filter. Um, the filter we were looking at, I'll just flip back, this kind of red filter is um, our hydrogen alpha. It's looking for a very specific color of light, very specific wavelength of light coming from the sun in order to see that detail around the edges of our sun. But using a white light filter, uh, we can see here some sunspots. Now, Ted, what's so interesting about these sunspots? Is it's a spot on the sun, so what? Uh, you know, at first glance, they are kind of boring. Um, in a way, actually, they, they are boring. They're actually cooler regions on the surface of the sun. So the surface that we see there is about 6,000 degrees. The sunspots we see they're getting down, they're only maybe about 4,000 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, I think that's the scale I'm using here. Um, so they're a little bit cooler. Um, they're actually areas where there's more, but they are areas where there's more magnetic field activity. So the sun is this roiling ball of plasma that's spinning around and it generates magnetic fields all over the place. And where we get some of those magnetic fields combining together, they actually cut off heat coming up from below, from the convection and radiative zones underneath the, the photosphere, underneath the surface of the sun. Um, so the fact that there are sunspots there, they're cooler, but they are more active. So there's more activity going on there. And with all those magnetic fields, sunspots are areas where we tend to get flares from. Um, so evidence of more sunspot activity is evidence of more flares um, and more exciting things happening in space weather, for better or worse. Um, I also think that these were very exciting sunspots to see. And I, I hope you have this image here, the scale image. Yeah, OK. Um, because, and this is a view just magnified, um, or excuse me, not magnified. This is a crop view of the larger, of the larger image. Um, just the little sunspots we're seeing there are about the size of the Earth. So this entire complex here, this active region, um, was uh, easily about a dozen Earths across. And it was actually visible um, with some solar safe binoculars from some observing reports I, I read. So they were actually, people were able to see them just with really basic, say 40, 50 magnification um, without needing a telescope or a camera. Um, I will say, though, uh, solar astronomy is really amazing. It's how I got started in um, astronomy, basically. I think, it's, I think it's the best type of astronomy because you get to do it during the day when it's warm. Um, but it is, a, it, can be a very, it, it, it is a dangerous activity as well. You are looking at the sun. Um, so if you want to get started, please make sure you're taking all proper safety precautions. Please make sure you're using a solar safe rated solar filter. Um, and if you're concerned at all, do not look at the sun because looking at the sun would improper faulty equipment is a good way to burn out your eyes. Don't do that. No, nobody wants that. You wouldn't be able to see anything day or night then. But yeah, these sunspots are huge. I mean, they're bigger than the entire planet Earth. Okay, well, this our sun is an example of this kind of low mass to medium mass star. So our sun was, was going to form this way. It starts in a nebula, much like the Orion behind me. And um, although it didn't really form, or we can't necessarily trace it back to where it would have formed with other stars. So that's kind of a little mystery that I have not heard clarification on. And maybe Tad, you have a little bit of clarification on what happened or did this, you know, did the sun form with other stars or did it form by itself? That's a great question. Uh, most likely it did. It formed with other stars, that is. Most likely it was part of an open cluster four or five billion years ago. Um, and then over time, those open clusters, they disperse. So the stars, they move apart from each other. Um, now, over four and a half billion years, the sun has gone around the galaxy about 20, 21 times. Uh, so finding the original siblings of the sun, the original cluster was part of, uh, that's, this, astronomers are searching for it. They really would like to find it, but it's an incredibly difficult task. It seems plausible that we could be um, still somewhat, they could be somewhat in the same region of the 
galaxy around us, but it also seems plausible that they wouldn't be at all. Um, but we can match up the chemical signatures, what we see, the components of the, the composition of the sun, what it's made of. We can match that up to other stars. And so hopefully maybe one day we will find uh, one of our lost siblings. Okay, well, the question came in about the sun. What happens after the sun flares erupt, the solar flares erupt and make a sunspot? Um, it depends on where they go. Sometimes those eruptions will go off into space in a direction that's not facing the earth. Sometimes those solar flares and the solar wind that can be released with them come towards the earth. Now, if that big, huge gust of wind comes to, towards the earth, it's full of a high energy particles and a lot of extra, we're gonna call radiation, um, from the sun. Now, thankfully, Earth here has a few different protective shields. Our first line of defense from getting hit in, with all this extra solar energy is our magnetic field. So I don't have any visuals of it, unfortunately, but it's a great question. So the Earth is a gigantic magnet. It has a North Pole, it has a South Pole, and it creates this invisible magnetic field around us, which acts a protective shield. So when that solar wind hits our magnetic field, it actually just gets deflected around it and goes off into space, and not much happens to us here on Earth. Sometimes a few of those particles that came in the solar wind get funneled into the north or south pole of our magnetic field. And those particles, those ener energetic particles will then interact with our atmosphere. And that will cause the northern or southern lights, depending on if it's going in the northern hemisphere or the southern he hemisphere. Oh, and Tad was able to find a picture of it. So we can see how the earth is a gigantic magnet with a north pole and a south pole. Um, and so most of that solar wind will get deflected around us, but sometimes it does get funneled into the north and south there creating our northern lights. But great question. Okay, well, let's see what happens after a sun like our, or after a star like our sun um, lives its life. Because stars, they have fuel. It, they're full of hydrogen and helium, mostly like our sun. And our sun is in the, going through a process where it's taking the hydrogen and fusing it together um, to make helium, and then eventually it'll make he take helium and it'll fuse that to make carbon. Well, our sun is not hot enough. It's not big enough to take carbon and start using that as a fuel source then. So what happens after a star starts running out of fuel or is not big enough or hot enough to burn the next fuel source that it's creating is that it turns into a red giant. And so this is Herschel's Garnett star, which is just at the bottom here, if we look back at our star map, just at the bottom of King Cepheus, it's that kind of bottom star right there. I think Cepheus looks like a house or an upside down ice cream cone. Um, depending on which way you look at it, it's a star right there kind of on this flat part. So that is where we're looking. Tad, want to talk us through a little bit of what is a red, what is a red giant? All right. Ah, Herschel's Garnet Star. This is a beautiful sight. Um, this... Uh, I think it, it's a very easy thing to take a picture of, and it's even better just to see with your own eyes. Um, so this red giant is where, again, the star has reached the end of its life. It's expanded outwards. Um, so as it expands the outer layers, they cool down. And cooler stars are red. In fact, generally on the temperature scale, on the temperature scale in fact, cooler things are red and hotter things are blue. Um, so this marks um, for almost every star, almost every star, uh, marks the end of its life. There's really no going back at this point, uh, unless I know, you know, we heard some great presentations from our students. So it's possible that some of them are making plans on how to reverse the red giant phase, but we'll leave that for a little while in the future. Um, sorry, sorry, I got to dash. I'm just, I'm getting the, the next thing set up there. So I just want to okay. go on already. So we have some other cool things coming up here. Um, but a red giant, yeah, like Tad said, it's just a star as it runs out of fuel, it'll start to swell up kind of like a giant balloon. Well, when it does that, it, um, its gases expand a little bit, so it's not as densely packed, and so it cools down. It's taking up more volume. And so that's why it goes from being, let's say, our, our sun, which is kind of a yellow-white star, as it would swell up and cool down, it turns into the kind of this orangish-red star that we're seeing here on Herschel's Garnett star. But as it continues to cool down and kind of expand and swell, um, what's the star to do next? I mean, it's, it's running out of fuel. It, it, does it just shut off? Let's take a look and see what happens to a star like our sun when it does run out of fuel and it swells up. For this one, we are going to take a look at the Dumbbell Nebula, M27. So we go back to our star map here. It's at the head of Cygnus the Swan. So Cygnus is part of, um, it's one of the three constellations part of the Summer Triangle, and it'll still be up in the sky for a little while yet this fall. And so if we see the wings of the swan going across here, 
Then we see the long neck of the swan coming down to the bright star Alberio. And M27 here is just off to the side. And so that's what we're looking at here. This is the Dumbbell Nebula. So once a star swells up and it's, it's, it's getting bigger like kind of a balloon, but it's getting very um, less dense, it's actually going to then poof out its outer layers of the star. And as it does this, it creates these planetary nebulas. Now, this is where I was getting into a star-forming nebula like the Orion Nebula, and now we have a different type of nebula we're talking about. This is a planetary nebula. Um, it's a little unfortunately named because it has nothing to do with planets. Planets are not formed in them. But it is the remains of stars like our sun. And so it poofs out. We can see kind of here it has this kind of lobed, two-lobed shape here, and that's how it was given the name Dumbbell Nebula. Um, so not all stars kind of expand or poof out their outer layers in the same shapes. And so uh, we often name the nebulas based on what their shapes remind us of. In this case, the Dumbbell Nebula here. And at the core, what's left over after the star poofs out its outer layers, at the very core of the star, that core is still there. It still has a whole bunch of energy built up, but it's no longer making any new energy. So it is now a dead star, but it still has energy to get rid of that it made previously when it was still alive. And so the core of this Dumbbell Nebula is the remains of a star called a white dwarf. Now, white dwarf stars are much, much smaller. Oh, and I forgot to do a demo. So let's see how big the sun is compared to the Earth, and we'll see how big the sun will be once it turns into a white dwarf. So I have a 16-inch kind of big, huge kickball, if you will. Now, if we think of this as the sun, I have a few different options. I have a tennis ball. That could maybe be the Earth. So take a look here. We're going to kind of uh, see which one we think it is. We could have the Earth. We could have this kind of wooden ball here. It's much smaller than tennis ball, but maybe that's the size of the Earth. I don't know. If you have an idea of how big the Earth would be compared to the sun, go ahead and use the Q&A box. But we also have this little tiny pin at the end of my pencil here. So the sunspot we saw um, when Tad was showing us that image that uh, we have of the sun, we saw the sunspots were quite large. They're about the size of Earth. Well, it turns out in this demo, the Earth is about the size of this pin here, that blue pin at the end of my pencil. And that's how big it is compared to the sun. Well, when the sun expands out and becomes a red giant, and eventually it'll poof out its outer stars here, that core of the sun that's left behind will be a white dwarf, which is about the size of the Earth. And so the sun will have expanded out and blow out, out its outer layers, and all that we left behind is the core that's that big. Now, this here is a comparison between Earth and Sirius B. One of um, Sirius A and Sirius B are a binary system, and the, they are the brightest star in our nighttime sky, visible with just our eyes. Um, but that's what's going to happen to the sun. It's a low medium mass star where it's going to, it formed inside of a nebula. It'll live its life. It has enough fuel to burn for about 10 billion years. It's a billion with a B. Um, it's only about halfway through its fuel. So it has about 5 billion years left of fuel left over before it goes through this process um, of becoming a red giant and uh, turning into a planetary nebula, like we saw in the Dumbbell Nebula there, and leaving behind a white dwarf like this. But I did say that all planetary nebulas are not the same. They don't poof out their outer layers. The stars don't poof out their outer layers the same. And so we have another planetary nebula in our sky, not too far away from M27, or the Dumbbell Nebula. So we were just at here at uh, M27. We're just going to slide a little bit over towards northwest in the constellation of Lyra, the Lear. We have M57. This is the Ring Nebula. And so you can see here, instead of poofing out its outer layers, kind of that dumbbell shape, it poofed them out in rings, like smoke rings. And so this is one of the areas of study that are happening, like why do stars die in different ways? Why do their nebulas um, expand in different ways? And part of it could be... Um, different level layers that it's built up, but could it, part of it could be the magnetic fields of these stars that are directing the material in certain ways and blocking it from going in other ways. And so kind of the formation of these planetary nebulas will tell us a little bit about the stars that are left behind or that they used to be before the nebulas formed. 
And so we have two really great planetary nebulas in our sky here. Um, so we had a question just come in. Uh, would you live on an island if you could? Sharing space um, series and documentary tomorrow. Um, thinking if you lived on islands, you could see different stars depending on where that island was. So here in Minnesota, you're going to see roughly the same um, same stars in the sky. If you go anywhere on the latitude 45 where we are here in the Twin Cities, you're going to see the same stars. Now, if I were to go live in an island, let's say in Hawaii, I'm going to see slightly different stars. They'll still be a crossover by what we see here in Minnesota, but they're going to be in a slightly different position. Now, if I go lived in a, go lived in an island down in the southern hemisphere, I'd have a totally new set of stars uh, to go see. And actually, I really love doing that. So. If you lived on an island and there was not a lot of light pollution, you'd have gorgeous views of the night sky. And, and I'll just add, uh, just a little qualifier to that question. Uh, does the island have burritos? <laughs> because that's a necessity for me. That's a deal breaker. So get back to me on that. Okay, so Tad's, Tad's requirement for living on an island would be burritos. I mean, tacos are one of my favorite foods. So the dark sky is related burrito. to a burrito. Okay, but let's now talk about, um, this is just one type of star. This is a medium, you know, low mass, medium sized star. Um, but there are some stars out there that are much, much larger. They're high mass stars. Now, when they, they're formed the same way through nebulas by collecting all that material like Tad showed us in, um, in that demo with the, the styrofoam balls, but they have a lot more mass. They have a lot more gas in them and they'll burn quite a bit hotter usually. They'll be quite bright. But when they die, they die different, they, in a different way than these low medium mass stars do. Because low medium mass stars, they don't have enough fuel to keep burning past about carbon or so. They just burn the first few elements on our periodic table. But when you get a higher mass star, you can start burning carbon and turning it into oxygen. Oxygen turning into things like uh, calcium or even down to iron, like the iron that's in our blood. So I think it's really cool because stars are making all these elements on our periodic table. The oxygen that we're breathing, the calcium that's in our bones, the iron that's in our bloodstream, all of these atoms, every atom that our bodies are made out of, all these higher um, elements had to have been formed inside of stars. Stars are the factories of outer space to create these elements that eventually get recycled. But in order to recycle, we have to get those elements out of a star and into something else like a planet or eventually maybe into you and me. So let's see how high mass stars how they die. And so for this, we're gonna look at uh, over at Taurus, the bull, over on our Eastern side of our star map here. So if we follow the bull's horns here, all the way up just off to the end of kind of that Eastern horn of the bull, we're gonna get the Crab Nebula. So again, this is called another nebula, but this is actually not a star forming nebula. This is not a planetary nebula. This is a supernova remnant. So stars that are high mass stars, when they die, when they run out of fuel, they don't just expand and poof out their outer layers. What they do, and Ted has a fun demo for us here in a moment, is when they swell up, part of them actually then, they have such strong gravity, they actually collapse back onto themselves. And then that inwards collapse can actually trigger an explosion out. And so Ted, what do you have for us here? Because explosions are kind of fun to talk about. They are. Controlled explosions are fun to talk about. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I will actually say, I actually forgot my safety goggles. So we're doing this one a little bit more dangerously this time. So everyone, for what, everyone watching at home, please make sure you do wear proper safety equipment. Um, it's another demo that you can do yourself. Um, in fact, I want to make sure I mentioned the previous one we did. I'm going to throw a link in the chat for where you can find it yourself. Um, again, it uses pretty common materials, things you can find around your home. Um, and for any parents watching who might be a little intimidated by all the science that goes into some of this, don't worry. There's a lot of great guides on that NiceNet uh, site, um, along with a lot of other great activities. All right. Um, and let's see what we can do. Okay. I hope everybody can see Tad as he rolls back into view here. There he is. What's he got? He's got a basketball. He's got a tennis ball. And he's got a little rubber golf ball, it looks like. Yeah. 
Okay, so each one of these bounces a little bit. We can see that, very nice. Okay, so what does this mean? Oh, and a tiny green one. Okay, kind of a green marble. They all kind of bounce a little bit, but nothing much higher than his knees or his waist. What? Hmm. Oh, he's stacking them like layers inside the star, the different elements inside the star, carbon, hydrogen, helium, that kind of things. Okay, so as a star expands, eventually it will collapse under its own gravity. What happens when it collapses under its own gravity, Tad? All those layers fall in towards the core and they get ejected in all directions and they go way farther out than they could on their own. So that's why he was showing us the bouncing. Each one didn't bounce very high on its own, but as it collapsed, hit the ground, which in this case, in this demo is the core of our star, they get ejected out further and they go huge in the supernova remnant explosion. Okay, let's see it again because explosions again, controlled explosions are a lot of fun. So that little green ball is going everywhere. It's hard to track because it has so much energy after that implosion, as after it hits the core and all the other the balls in there, it goes everywhere. And so that's what gets us back to our crab nebula here. All those star layers, they fell in towards this core of this massive, massive star. They hit the core, they uh, rebounded and ejected outwards. Now, in this case, this star did not turn into a black hole because that infalling material, um, it, can, it compresses. Each layer close to the core compresses itself, um, or the, the layers there, um, and it compresses it down past a white dwarf into what's called a neutron star. And so what's happening in atoms and why we call it a neutron star is if you think of an atom, you have electrons, you have protons, you have neutrons. Electrons are negatively charged. Protons are positively charged. You put them together, you get a neutron, neutral charge. And so what happens is that explosion squishes them all in, in the atoms. It squishes the electrons into the protons and creates neutrons. And so we have this tiny, really compact core that's all just neutrons. And that's what's at the center of our crab nebula here. And so this was taken actually just Wednesday night, I believe, here live on our roof deck. So Wednesday, we had some clear skies out, enough to get us a few uh, live shots that we did Wednesday night here this week. Um, but also to take this image of the Crab Nebula, a supernova remnant. So it's the remnants, the leftovers of that explosion. And we can kind of see, um, kind of explain it out in different ways. Now, the reason we would call it the Crab Nebula, and you'd see this in, in uh, better or higher resolution images like from um, Hubble, is it has these little tendrils um, that kind of cross in. They almost look like crab legs kind of going in. And so you can see some detail here in this explosion of how different particles and different heavier gases um, kind of were left behind and some moved faster than others. And so we call this the crab nebula because of kind of its shape here and the tendrils that were left behind. So this is just one example of a supernova remnant because again, stars explode in many different ways. And so they'll have different shapes out there. In this case, um, the neutron star, sometimes they start to spin and they can spin very, very fast. And when they can do that, sometimes they send out these beams of light, kind of like a lighthouse that spin around and we see these pulses of light. So we call them pulsars. And these are a form of a dead star that are living inside these supernova remnants. Now, again, these stars like white dwarfs are all dead. They're no longer making their own energy. Their nuclear fusion processes have ended. And so that's why they're remnants. They're leftovers of stars. They are dead stars. They still have lots of built up energy. They're still shining bright. We can still see them in our night sky. Okay. So if you do have questions, I do encourage you to use the Q&A box. Um, so we can maybe talk a little bit more about some of our images we've taken from our roof deck. Um, but we are nearing the end of our night. So Ted, is there anything that we forgot to talk about here tonight? Um, I feel like we haven't talked about the greatest, um, the greatest type of object in space yet. Um, I mean, no, yeah, I, well, planetary nebulas are really amazing. I, I do think they're really great. Um, the star forming regions, M42, um, like you said, it, they're incredible. Um, open clusters are really growing on me as things too, as I've, as I've really observed them more. Um, but I just, I feel like, I feel like we're missing something. I don't, I don't know what it is though. 
Do you, yeah. Do you, any idea? I no. mean, stars are great. So if we had like a ton of like a ton of stars, like a like a, a ton, like a, like hundreds of thousands of stars, what would that look like? We, that'd be something cool to see. Like if our Earth was orbiting hundreds of thousands of stars. No, I think it's just if there were like hundreds of thousands of stars, like really close together. I think that'd be really cool. Kind of like if we were living inside one of those open clusters or even a globular cluster would be hundreds of thousands would be globular. Like that would be quite cool. Cluster. I think that's what we've been missing. I don't think we've seen any globular clusters. Okay. We talked a lot about them earlier in the week because they are kind of that jam-packed, tightly knit areas. Uh, we had a question coming in from Amar, age 12. What happens to dead stars once they use up all their energy? Also, are dead stars still as bright as they were before? These are great questions. In the case of a supernova, when a, when a high mass star dies and it explodes, it can actually be brighter than the galaxy it belongs to. So these explosions are so, so super duper bright that sometimes they can be seen in the middle of the day. So there's so much energy getting, uh, get, getting given off by these explosions, they can outshine entire galaxies. And that's actually how we start finding some of these supernovas in other galaxies is we'll see a picture of a galaxy and it'll be kind of the same. And then all of a sudden we'll see a brand new star and be so much brighter than the rest of everything around it. So we know the supernova went off. Okay, so dead stars can be much, much brighter than the original star because of the explosion. But like I said, um, a lot of that star, those dead stars have a lot of built up energy just stored from when they did make it, but they're not making any new energy. Um, depending on what they are, those stars will eventually, when they do give off all their energy, they'll kind of die and become dark stars, if you will. Um, that's not a technical term. So don't quote me on the, the dark star part. Um, but some of the white dwarfs are out there. It's estimated they have so much built up energy in order for them to um, kind of turn off or stop shining or stop giving off the light that they've built up, that they'd have to be older than the age of the universe itself. And so dead stars, they can eventually run out of fuel. It just, our universe isn't old enough. It's only 13.8 billion years and so some of the dead stars are still shining because it hasn't been around long enough to use up all their fuel. So those are great questions. Okay. Well, stellar life cycles are one of my favorite topics to talk about astronomy because our sky is rich in evidence of stars of all different stages. And when they explode like this crab nebula here, all that stuff that's inside them gets ejected out. We see all those bright, bright lights. Again, almost uh, sometimes visible during the daytime. Um, but all the material that they made, the carbon, the oxygen, the iron, gets recycled back out into space, where eventually it'll form a new star-forming nebula, like again we started with, Orion behind me, and new stars will be made out of that recycled material. So they'll have different materials to start with. And so stars are just like the recycling centers of outer space. Okay, another question came in. What is your favorite, uh, maybe I'll let you answer this, Tad. Uh, what is your favorite book to learn about stars, constellations, and how to navigate our way in the night sky? Oh, I wish I wish I had them with me. Um, I brought all. Uh, yeah. Um, oh, there's a bunch of ones. Um, Turn left at Orion is one of my favorites. Uh, easy name to remember. Turn left at Orion. Um, I think also, and it's not necessarily a book, but um, Sky and Telescope Magazine has been uh, for me an incredible resource over the years. Um, they, of course, have their paper copy. They have digital. Um, and they post a lot of free articles, um, and they have star charts online as well. Um, and then, um, uh, oh, uh, I actually, I got it years and years ago. Celestron um, makes a star map, which I, which I really like. Um, and that's, uh, Celestron's known for their telescopes. I have one of their telescopes too. Um, but they make a really great star map that I, that I really like using. Thank you. I'm always looking for a good book, a new, a new good book. Okay, and I think if there's no remaining questions coming in, I think that brings us to the end of our time together tonight. So I'm going to turn things over back to Holly. Thank you all. Enjoy your weekend. Stay safe. All right, folks. Thank you, Sarah and Tad. That was awesome. Thank you, our audience. Um, we're just so appreciative to any, everyone tuning in um, this evening and joining us for our, our final night of Minnesota Statewide Star Party. Please know that the Bell's free virtual programs, like the one tonight, are made possible through the generous support of donors like you. Please consider making gift of any size by visiting our website and clicking join and give at the top of the page. All right. 
our time is really coming to a close. And so I'd like to say one final thank you to you, our viewers, our partners across the state, to all our presenters and guests who share their knowledge and passion and enthusiasm for Dark Skies this week. I want to say thank you to our generous funders, Ruth and John Huss, and the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund, part of the Clean Water, Land, and Legacy Amendment. And of course, our Bell Museum team, who has worked tirelessly behind the scenes and in front of the camera throughout this week and in the many months leading up to this week. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful and proud of that, that team. We'll be in touch next week by email with a survey to hear more about what you thought of your statewide star party experience and to share out links to videos and resources from the week. We've been recording everything. And so if you miss something, um, we will serve it up to you hopefully next week. Please don't forget to submit your observations to Globe at Night. Remember, you have until November 16th for this month's campaign. So I'm encouraging everyone to get involved in that citizen science project. And remember, you can access all kinds of great resources and information at our statewide Star Party website. And the short link is z.umn.edu slash SWSP-2020. Thank you all. Please take good care, be well, and good night.